Pokemon is a massive fictional franchise that spans video games, TV shows, movies, manga, merchandise, and more. And being nearly 30 years old, there's bound to be some things that just don't make sense to you, even if you are a hardcore Pokemon fan. So in this video, I'm gonna do my best to explain some things in Pokemon that you never understood. And the first thing that I wanted to address is the reason why Lick is a ghost-type move. The action of licking something is about as standard as it gets when it comes to Pokemon moves, and I think just about everyone would say that Lick seems like it should probably be a normal-type move versus a ghost-type move. So why does it have that typing? Well, with a little bit of digging, we can find out what I believe is probably the most likely answer. You see, Lick is a move from Generation 1, and being a Ghost-type move as well, this essentially made it the signature move of the Gengar line. Gengar and its pre-evolutions are the only Ghost types in Gen 1, and as such, they, along with Jinx, are the only Pokémon who could learn this move during this generation. So I think the reason why Lick is a Ghost type move has a lot to do with the Pokémon that it was specifically intended for. The connection between Lick and the Gengar family goes even further as well, as not only do the types match up, but these Pokémon also have extra big tongues with which to perform the move, and the reason why they have big tongues I think pretty much explains everything. You see, like many Pokémon, the Gengar line are based around various yokai, and a common trait amongst many yokai are big, giant tongues. For example, Haunter takes heavy inspiration from the Akaguchi, and it is just one of multiple different yokai with big, long tongues. Additionally, since yokai come from Japanese folklore and mythology, and many of them are either spirits or have other supernatural connections, I think that is where the ghost typing on Lick likely originated from. I feel like it was probably thought of as a move originating from yokai rather than just your basic lick, and the ghost typing of the Gengar line, along with the supernatural nature of yokai themselves, caused it to ultimately be labeled as a ghost type move. Next, I'm gonna tackle a big one, and that is the subject of Macargo's body temperature. I've actually discussed this one before, but this time I've got a better, more simple explanation. It's been well discussed that according to the Pokedex, Macargo's body temperature is 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun. So how in the blue blazes can it exist without literally incinerating the Earth? Well, the answer is actually a lot simpler than you might think. The key phrase we need to look at here in order to solve this is body temperature. Sure, Macargo's body temperature might be 18,000 degrees like the Pokedex says, but that doesn't mean that it's literally that hot. For example, the body temperature of a person who is in good health and not sick is nearly 100 degrees, but if you go and touch that person, they're clearly not going to be 100 degrees to the touch. That's because body temperature is measured internally, and therefore, we can reasonably assume the reason why we haven't all been burned to a crisp by Macargo yet is because that 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit is kept inside its body, which is what protects us from being melted. And yeah, as a result, Macargo is still going to be a little hotter on the outside of its body too, as a fire type naturally would be anyway, but not hot enough to actually cause any kind of catastrophic damage. And if you want to be hot like Macargo, you need to check out today's sponsor, Manscaped, and their new scalp buffer. Your head and your hair are key factors in your hotness, and the scalp buffer is not only a great way to wash both your head and scalp, but it can actually help you attain healthier hair as well, which, you guessed it, equals more hotness. 
The thick silicone bristles are 100% antibacterial to help prevent germs from hopping onto your head. And they also exfoliate the scalp to help prevent dry skin and buildup of hair products. It also helps to increase the lather of your shampoo too, which means you can use less and save more. Not to mention that Manscaped's two-in-one shampoo and conditioner goes great with it. And it's personally the shampoo that I use every day. So if you want to get hot and up your shower game, you can check out the scalp buffer with the link in the description. And when you use code HOOPSVGM at checkout, you'll also get 20% off plus free shipping. And it even helps support the channel too, so it's a sweet deal. So again, check that out with the link in the description, and a big thank you to Manscaped for supporting the channel. Another conundrum that people bring up from time to time is how Mr. Mime, and now by extension its evolution Mr. Rhyme, can be female even though their names clearly indicate that they're male Pokemon. This one is actually really easy to explain, and the explanation is definitive as well. The reason Mr. Mime and Mr. Rhyme can be female is because these Pokemon's original Japanese names have nothing to do with gender and don't contain any male honorifics. So it's simply a case of the localization into English that has caused this issue, which at the time wasn't even an issue anyway since gender wasn't even a thing in Pokemon until Gen 2. So really, it's kinda just a case of a localization quirk combined with an unintentional retcon. Another one you could say has bugged a lot of people over the years is why bug types are strong against dark types. This is another one I have attempted to explain before, but this time I have a much more definitive answer. On the surface, it doesn't really seem to make sense, and I think a lot of people have probably just thought it was for balancing purposes, and maybe to help make bug types stronger, but there is an actual reason behind it. In Japan, there is a classic and super well-known superhero franchise known as Kamen Rider, and the titular Kamen Rider characters often wear costumes with an insect theme. So, with bugs having an affiliation with superheroes in Japan, it makes sense that they would be strong against dark-type Pokémon, which is also known as the evil type in Japanese. Like the Mr. Mime situation, this is just another one of those things that sadly gets lost in localization. One particular thing in Pokemon that seems like it's really hard to explain has to do with Professor Elm and how he apparently was the person who discovered Pokemon eggs. I'm sure we're all really happy for Professor Elm for making this discovery and everything, but a lot of people have wondered how no one could have known that Pokemon eggs were a thing until this point especially since the discovery was apparently made right around the time of the Gen 2 games. This one honestly seems like something you would just have to chalk up to it being a video game, but there is actually something within the series that can explain this quite well. While it admittedly crosses canons, there is a novelization of the anime that was written by the anime's original head writer, Takeshi Shudo, that reveals a lot of detail about the Pokemon world. I've discussed this novelization before, so I'll just cut straight to the chase and talk about the part that's relevant here, and that is that it's mentioned in the novelization that Pokemon literally just poofed into existence one day. Like, genuinely, one day they weren't there, and then the next day, they were there. This seems to attempt to explain why Pokemon are viewed as so mysterious and why there's still so much to learn about them apparently, and again, while it does cross canons and also comes from a novelization on top of that, so who knows how seriously we can even take this, it does perfectly explain how Professor Elm could have been the one to discover Pokemon eggs. If Pokemon were still a fairly new thing at the time, someone around that time period would have had to have been the one to make the discovery, and if Pokemon just randomly appeared one day out of thin air, it makes sense that it would have took a few years afterwards to get over the shock of that, and then eventually make the discovery around the time period of Generation 2. 
This is probably the craziest explanation I'm gonna give in this video, but technically, I guess it's also the one that is based on the most in-universe information, which overall is just really crazy. Something else in Pokemon that has also seemed inexplicable over the years is how TMs are able to teach moves to Pokemon. They are typically depicted as CDs, and it just doesn't seem like it makes sense how a CD is gonna magically give a Pokemon a new move. Like, are they watching an instructional video on how to do the move or something? Well, not exactly, because I've actually had a theory for a while now that I think explains pretty definitively how this works. The truth is that Pokemon are probably taking a page out of Digimon's book because Pokemon are digital data, at least according to this theory. For one, you can store them inside of a computer, so that's a big red flag, and when it comes to the TMs, this makes perfect sense as well, since what is happening is that the TM is essentially updating the Pokemon's software with a new move in the same way that you would install a new program onto your computer back in the day with an installation disk. Now, I don't know how that connects to Infinity Energy or anything else we know about Pokemon and what they actually are, but I feel like this definitely plays a part in it, at least to some sort of degree, because it lines up just a little too well with multiple different things to just be totally wrong, in my opinion. Now it's time for the big one though, because I am now going to explain how Ash Ketchum is so insanely strong. We have seen this 10 year old carry extremely heavy Pokemon with ease, and for years we have asked how he does it. And now I am going to give you as close to an actual explanation as I think we can possibly get. Interestingly enough, this is actually something that has been officially addressed by Pokemon themselves. On their official website, there is an article which discusses Ash's ripped physique, and it says, Ash might look like your average 10 year old Pokemon trainer, but over the years he's demonstrated above average strength. There were those times he appeared to comfortably hold Larvitar without difficulty. While that might not sound like a big deal, the fact that Larvitar weighs 158.7 pounds makes this quite an impressive physical feat. That's just the tip of the iceberg though, as Ash is later seen casually carrying the 2204.4 pound Cosmoem like it's a teeny tiny cutie fly. We know Ash and his Pokemon take on a lot of special training throughout the series. Apparently, it's paying off. As much of a non-explanation as this is, it does come straight from the source, so I feel like we do need to pay it some attention. It's interesting that they mention the special training that Ash and his Pokemon go through here, because it makes me think that maybe Ash is like a Pokemon, and he has stats and IVs and EVs too. So maybe 25 plus years of traveling the Pokemon world and doing nothing but training have maxed out literally all of his stats to the point where carrying a Cosmoem isn't really that big a deal. Another thing you could also take into consideration with this is the bond that Ash has with his Pokemon. We know that a trainer's bond with their Pokemon can do a lot of crazy things, everything from cause them to mega evolve to literally taking on the appearance of their trainer. So I don't think it's actually that far-fetched that Ash having a close bond with his Pokemon could cause them to become lighter in some way to the point where he has the ability to pick them up and carry them around. Then again, he also lifted this massive log, and I don't think it had any feelings for Ash, so it's probably just his insane stats. For real though, while the answer to this is clearly that he's a cartoon character, I think the closest that we're going to be able to come to trying to explain this in-universe is that it has something to do with these explanations that I've given. I mean, if we have an official statement on the subject, it's hard to argue any kind of unrelated opinion. So until further notice, I'm just gonna assume that Ash went through some serious hyper training and is just jacked out of his mind. That is just my interpretation though, so you'll have to let me know what you think about this and all of these other confusing things in the comments below. 
Leaving a like if you enjoyed the video also really helps out too, and if you'd like to further support the channel, you can always listen to my Pokemon remixes on Spotify or wherever you get your music, and you can check out my Patreon for exclusive perks and benefits, all of which is extremely appreciated. With that said, thank you guys so much for watching, and until the next one, as always, I will smell you guys later.